I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of something much more general about, about patient skin and, and why I think it's fragile, but also to pick up on some of the themes that we've already heard this morning about preventative care and how we manage prevention and also about what we just heard about planning ahead, thinking about what we do now and how that affects the patient's future as well as our future because it does affect what we do. So I seem to be going back up there we go. So what I want to do is thinking about what we do to patients, what we do sometimes by our actions and what we do sometimes by what we don't do, what we don't think about and thinking about the frequency with which damage occurs that we could actually, if we thought it through, call healthcare associated damage and start to think much more about preventative care because I think sometimes we're, we are so busy and on such a treadmill, we manage what we've got in front of us rather than having the luxury of the time to plan ahead and be much more proactive in what we do. And that's really what I want to put through in, in this presentation is about being proactive rather than reactive. Because a lot of the time we spend managing wounds that if we just had had the time and the space to think about what we could do to prevent them, we would have been able to do in the first place. So you've all heard about harm-free care, hopefully. You all know about harm-free care. This is my list of wounds. Which of these fall into harm? How many of them? What, what would you associate with harm-free care? Pressure ulcers? Yeah? That's my list. I think all of these are potentially harms that if we planned, if we had the time, we could prevent a lot of. Not all of. I didn't put burns on there, sorry. Because they tend to be managed by other people. That just follows on exactly from what you said, doesn't it? But again, I think that's very much the ethos of your service, focusing a lot on preventative care now. So just a quick reminder, what we're dealing with is skin, and we talked about this in the workshops yesterday, so that for those of you who are here yesterday, largest organ of the body, very much taken for granted, unless it's on your face, in which case you will spend huge sums of money on probably very useless cream, just because it comes in a nice jar and smells quite nice. And particularly if you put those nice sciency words on the label, you somehow think that's better than that really cheap one that you could buy in a plain jar. But it serves many, many functions, and that if we can keep the skin intact, then we're doing everybody a big favour. Skin's fragile for lots of reasons, and this is really what I want to focus on. The people we deal with, once they become patients, actually have many of these conditions, either individually in, or in multiplicity. So the older people get, the more fragile your skin gets. Um, I went out somewhere with my daughter the other day, and she really brought this home to me, because part of my age, you'll notice I've got my glasses on my head now, uh, can't see anything, and I said to her, oh, will you just help me put this eyeliner on, because I can do one eye but not the other one, because if I shut the eye, I can't see a thing. And she put some eyeshadow on for me, and she said, Mum, your skin's really stretchy and terrible. I don't know why you bother wearing eyeshadow. <laughs> Thank you, darling. So... You know, extremes of age isn't that extreme. So the young ones you've showed, as you get older, things change. Patients taking steroids, there's been a really interesting question going around at my local group recently saying, on Waterloo, where it says steroids, do we include inhalers? What do you think? Steroids, steroid, isn't it? If the patient is taking steroid into their body, they're taking steroid in. Dehydration, very underestimated. We spend lots of time talking about nutrition and the importance for skin, but we forget about hydration. And skin can be dehydrated for many reasons. You heard Paul this morning talking about neuropathy and how that can affect skin and give you dry skin. Patients often don't drink as much as they should because if they drink, they have to go for a wee. And they don't want to go for a wee because it's very hard for them to walk and lots of other things. Skin can become very overhydrated. We put lots of chemicals on our skin. We expose it to physical forces. And many patients have allergies or sensitivities to, to a whole host of different things. So if skin is subject to these things, we get these really common skin problems. So we see skin that's macerated, and that can be related to a whole host of things. Excoriated, maceration related to fluid, purely fluid. Excoriation, much more about the chemical constituents of that fluid. So looking at a much more painful kind of damage. It can become dry, it can blister. I'm pleased to hear a consistent approach to blisters because I always fudge that question. If I get anybody who says to me, I've got a patient with a burn, what do you do with the blister? I say, you do whatever your local burns unit say. 
So now I know the answer is, if it's more than a fingernail size, you de-roof it wherever you are. So skin stripping, and skin stripping can occur for lots of reasons, and skin tears. So maceration is a bigger issue, I think, than people, that people uh, realise. Where you get fluid on the skin, you get this swelling and overhydration, and the stratum corneum can get much thicker, and it takes upon the appearance of macerated skin. So have any of you seen this really kind of cobblestony appearance? It's like the old-fashioned cobbles, where the skin is actually so swollen and so thick if you are not careful and the patient slides down the bed or you take a dressing off or you're, you handle the skin badly, you actually take the whole of that level of the skin off because the skin's so waterlogged, it has no capacity to stretch any further. And the elasticity of the skin is really important in the way it functions. Main causes for maceration are often healthcare related. So remember my focus on this is what can we prevent? And incorrect dressing use is healthcare related. So it goes exactly back to what you were saying before about we must think about what we're doing with these dressings and we must know what their functions are and we must assess the wound and know what we're doing with them. So although we would generally say things like if you've got a necrotic wound, put a hydrogel on it or a sluffy wound and you want to debride it, put a hydrogel on. If you've got a sluffy wound that is very wet, please do not put a hydrogel on it because you just finish up with a big soggy wet mess. Manage the exudate. It may be that you're not changing the dressing frequently enough. Now, in a hospital, there is absolutely no excuse for that because there's somebody there 24 hours a day. In the community, it might be more difficult. It may be around getting access to the patient because the patient's at work, is busy, um, has other things on. But try and plan for that. It can be about high levels of exudate, and it can also be around wounds about urinary incontinence, particularly in the lower limb. How many of you see patients who have incontinence that you find dripping into their bandages? And they don't like to admit to it, I wouldn't want to admit to it, but you've got to have those conversations with patients. And in that way, you can prevent a whole host of damage occurring. Excoriation is slightly different, presents differently, and you're all very familiar with this common presentation called lots of different things, incontinence-associated dermatitis, moisture lesions. I've just termed it by a very generic term of excoriation. Because the difference here is not just the fluid, it's the primary irritant. And particularly if you mix urine and faeces together, then you've got a major impact on the skin. So again, a very preventable problem. Manage the patient's incontinence. That doesn't mean give them pads. That means find out why they're incontinent. Find out what you can do to help them. Is it as simple as moving them nearer to the toilet? Or do they need a referral to the continence service? I find it quite sad that it seems accepted that the older you get, that you're probably going to get incontinent. There's no reason for it. There's absolutely no reason for it. And equally, if the patient is incontinent and you're having to do some kind of <coughs> emergency management and use pads or pants or whatever that may be, make sure they get checked and changed. The patient's skin should be well looked after. Use barrier products on the skin if necessary. Because fluid sitting on the skin gives you both maceration and excoriation. And in the same way as I said with the maceration, it's easy to remove that surface of the skin. Once the skin is soggy and starting to excoriate, it's really easy to chafe the skin. I don't know if any of you have ever been doing any kind of sporting activity, running, cycling, whatever that may be. You get hot and sweaty, and where your clothes rub against your skin, so in your groin, or I cycle, so around the bottoms of my padded pants, if it's rubbing on you, you can take quite a lot of your skin off but you should plan for these things and stop that occurring. The opposite, obviously, is skin dryness and dehydration. And normally, skin remains at a healthy moisture belt level because of sebum secretion. Less so in diabetic patients, once they have autonomic neuropathy. I'm sure you've all seen diabetic patients with those horrible, cracked, calloused feet. And I'm sure many of you experience a similar, maybe not as extreme, over summer. How many of you wear flip-flops all summer? and get actually much drier skin than usual because your, your feet aren't in your shoes. They're not sweaty and soaking up that hydration. So if you know the patients are prone to this, use moisturiser. It doesn't have to be anything expensive, anything complicated, but it has to be used regularly. Wash the skin, dry the skin, apply moisturiser. Keep away from fragrances and sensitizers, and that's much better. But do think about systemic dehydration. Is your patient drinking as much as they should? And if not, why not? Think about things like autonomic neuropathy. Think about other dermatological skin conditions. What other creams and lotions is that patient having on? Also think about dry skin because of ageing, 
for the ladies in the room of a certain age, think about hormonal changes to your skin. When, when you reach that age where you hit menopause, there's lots of things they don't tell you. They don't tell you that your skin starts to fall apart, that your hair gets thinner. Many ladies, that dryness uh, affects their mucosa. So lots of ladies of that age suddenly start snoring. It's not pleasant. You're not expecting it. They didn't tell you that. So do check if people have got that dry skin because of hormonal changes. They don't have to be uh, menopausal. It can be lots of other things. Teenagers go through this as their hormones change. So look at what you can do to help them. It might be about the soap they're using. So I, I, I know, where's Rosie? Is Rosie in the room? Rosie often mentions, because she deals with nursing homes a lot, that things like Mother's Day and Christmas, for the few weeks after that, she gets lots of, of referrals for patients with sore, cracked skin. Because all these patients get bought, you know, the nice flowery soaps for Mother's Day and for Christmas, and they all put their perfume soaps all over them and their skin cracks and goes too dry. So think about what medication the patient's on and what you can do about that. Blistering is an issue for many, many reasons. We've seen some really good examples of burn blister, and I don't think I've got any burn blisters in here. But there, you need to know why the patient is blistering. So is it about an infection? Is it particular bacteria that we're seeing? We know that pressure ulcers can present as a blister, so category two pressure ulcers are blisters. And certainly inappropriate use of adhesive dressings can cause blisters. Immediately postoperatively is the classic example. So I don't mind admitting this was me. I had my hysterectomy and I planned it to the nth degree. The day I was going, I took my own sutures, I did my own disinfection, I took my post-op dressing. What I didn't plan for was the fact that the theatre staff would put this really big pad with a lot of me fix over the top of my lovely, lovely dressing. And those blisters persisted for three weeks and were more painful than my wound. So do think about what you're putting on the skin and how adhesive that is. This is a much more extreme version, but it often occurs with things like orthopaedics where you get a lot of post-operative swelling. So they put the dressing on tight to maintain hemostasis, to keep everything held together, and then the wound and the tissue swell underneath it, and that adhesive's really stuck, and what you see is this separation of the epidermis from the dermis and these really tight, fluid-filled blisters that can be very painful. You can get disease-related blisters, um, and these are far less common. This is bullous pemphigoid, but again, they're very poorly understood. This is actually uh, the mother of a friend of mine, and I got a phone call from her on a Sunday morning to say, I'm really sorry to bother you, but mum was discharged from hospital on Wednesday, and um, she's 84. She used to be popping out to Asda all the time. Now she's at home, stuck to her chair, because the hospital didn't refer to the district nurses, the daughter had rang the district nurses and, and they said, we don't put cream on. And so then nobody had been to see her. And she was covered head to foot in these massive, massive blisters. Uh, it, took, it took us four days to get somebody to go and see her, which I thought was really sad. But it's because they didn't understand what it was. They, she'd been in, under dermatology. They said, oh, it's a dermatological thing. She needs cream. We don't do cream. That's social care. Fair enough, that's a reasonable comment. But they didn't listen to the patient's daughter saying, actually, a lot of these blisters have de-roofed. She's stuck to her chair, she's stuck to her clothing. The wounds are bleeding. She needs some help. And a lot of that could have been prevented with some really simple non-adherent dressing, some contact layers, exactly like you should. That's all I did. I turned up with some tubular dressing, some non-adherent layers, covered her in them, and she was much better. Didn't take a lot. Patients sometimes react badly to their drugs. This is antibiotic related problems, lots of big blisters, very painful. We had the do we pop, do we not pop discussion. And actually, in fact, they resolved fairly quickly and flattened down, but very difficult to manage. And what we needed to do and what was quite difficult to persuade this patient of is we needed to moisturize the skin just to stop those blisters from cracking and splitting because we knew that they would probably settle quite quickly. Skin stripping, very much a healthcare related thing often about incorrect removal of adhesive dressings or putting extra tape on to help things stay in place. There are lots of patients where it's hard to get a dressing to stick on and the temptation is to just put the extra bit of a bit of a film dressing over the top to keep it in place, a bit of extra me fix so that you get a few extra days where you don't have to keep changing the dressing. 
but you can see here two examples that the one on your right um, is a very classic one we see it in lots of papers of if you just pull an adhesive dressing off you can see it physically lifting the skin up the other one's a much more common one this is use of a hydrocolloid over a fairly small wound but what's happened because it's actually on an ankle is while the patient's in bed because they move the leg up and down, that's the edge of the hydrocolloid rolling up. And as it rolls, it's not ready to come off, so it's very stuck, and it starts pulling the patient's skin away with them. So think about what products you're using. Think about how you place them. Think about just a simple piece of a tubular dressing over that would have stopped the edge of that rolling on an ankle. It doesn't have to be a bandage. You're not applying compression. It's just something to stop the edges of the dressing catching. And the problem we have with dressings is we kind of have this tension between we want it to stick, but we also want it to come off. Because it's quite frustrating when you go back two hours later and the dressings come off, isn't it? You'll want it to stay in place. And, and that's not about workload, it's about achieving the best for the patient. So the adhesive should stick well, but remove easily. It needs to stretch because often wounds do get inflamed. It needs to cope with moisture from the exudate, but also patients do quite like to shower and bathe. So we need to plan ahead. It needs to conform to the wound. It needs to seal when you cut it. Because lots of dressings you cut to shape or try and join two together and not collapse or self-stick. Have you ever done that? Take the backing off a dressing and gone, put it in the bin, try the next one. Because it's all stuck to itself, you should be able to pull it apart. But it should also be movable because you don't always get it right. Not leave a lot of residue. That's a really common cause of skin problems around the wound and be easy to apply. So. Preventing skin stripping is not difficult, it's just about thinking ahead. Choose the right dressing in the first place. Make sure that the person taking it off knows how to take it off. You all know with films about putting your hand on and stretching them, there is a whole range of products now that if a dressing is really stuck, you can sprinkle over it or paint over it to help lift it off. If you're really stuck, use, if you're in the patient's own home, use something simple like olive oil that will usually lift it off or soapy water. And just think ahead. Skin tears eminently preventable healthcare associated problem. Anybody going to disagree with that? Lots of skin tears occur when patients are in some form of care provision. That might be a nursing home, a residential home, it might be in a hospital. It might be just be by seeing the nursing, uh, the nursing staff. Um, lots of these occur on the upper and lower limbs and on the dorsum of the hand. In babies, they tend to be associated with use of dressings and devices. So you can see straight away there are lots of things that we need to be thinking of and planning ahead with. One of the problems is we, we don't really record them well. A lot of skin tears occur when patients fall. So we tend to record the fall, and that's what gets recorded as the harm, but not the skin tear. And we also don't agree on how we record them. So we maybe need to listen to our burn colleagues and collapse these three different systems down to one system so we all know what we're talking about. These two fairly straightforward ones, the lady with the arm, so you can see a watch on. The dog jumped up and pushed a watch up her arm. Nothing more complicated than that. The other one, that beautiful V-shaped one, lady was taking her tights off and caught her leg with her nail. So it doesn't have to be anything difficult. What these two patients have in common is very dry, fragile skin. And this is where we can start to make some difference. If you look at the causes of skin tears, most of them are related to trauma. Um, and you can see that third bar down is whilst performing activities of daily living. This is not you know, cycling, walking on tight ropes or, or anything that you'd class as a dangerous sport. This is getting up, getting washed, getting dressed, going about your daily life that causes issues for people. So there's been a really good study done in the silver chain, chain of nursing homes in Australia that says if you moisturize skin, twice a day, you significantly reduce the amount of patients who get skin tears. Now, that's not a difficult thing to do, is it? It's not an expensive thing to do. It doesn't necessarily require you to do it. The patient or the patient's family could do that. But by doing that simple thing, by thinking about things, again, Rosie said something to me the other day that I thought, that's so straightforward. She'd spoken to one of her care homes and said, your coffee tables, you know, the thing that patients bang their legs in all the time, are all square with corners. Can you get round ones? Why don't people think about things like that? Why didn't I think of that? That's really easy, isn't it? It is about simple things like that, and you can prevent these happening. Then the patient doesn't get the skin tear. If it's on the lower limb, it doesn't stay there and then become a leg ulcer, and the patient doesn't get an infection, and they're not on your casebook for weeks and weeks and weeks. Simple moisturisation can prevent that from happening. 
So if, if you look at this about where I started from, can we, by some thought and proactive thinking, start to prevent more wounds rather than just manage and heal wounds, then we can actually move forward in what we do a lot. And I haven't completed the table because it's a lot of writing on a small table. But just looking at what we're doing, so moisture lesions, mechanism of prevention, pretty simple. Keep the skin clean and dry. If needs be, use a barrier product. We've got lots of information on barrier products. We've got good guidance. We've got best practice statements. Skin tears, really simple. I just said twice daily moisturisation. There's a very good randomised control trial. Makes it different. Venous leg ulcers. We've got really good systems for managing venous leg ulcers. We've got pretty good systems for preventing recurrence of leg ulcers. But how much work do we do on preventing them occurring in the first place? How many of you, like me, walk around town, or particularly around a supermarket like this? Look at her legs. Just, I wonder if anybody's talked to her about, she could maybe get some hosiery. Do you all do that? Yeah? But we don't have a service for that, look at her legs, do we? But going back to that model, of the, like the leg club model particularly lends itself well, because you get people coming with the patients. Why can't we have a, a well-being, a, a good health, association with that so that when you're coming they get education about what the risk factors are what you can do to prevent it's a really good social model we could do some first aid warning on burns if we had all these people together and they're coming of their own accord and they're getting their coffee and a cake why not use that as an opportunity to tell them what they can do to help prevention and how we can support them in those preventative activities and then we will be saving ourselves lots of work for the future I think Paul very beautifully covered diabetic foot ulcers this morning and, and scared you all about the loss of limb and loss of life and what your mortality rates are, so I don't need to go over that. But again, he was saying, if you assess risk, you can prevent, and that makes a significant difference. Prevents ulcers, prevents amputation. Surgical site infection, you all know the things you need to do. But what about surgical wounds that dehiss? Do you all get those abdomens that pop open? Do they tend to be patients who are larger and patients who have multiple comorbidities. Just judge how many tablets they've got. But what do you do when you know that patient's going for theatre? If it's, if it's an emergency, you can't plan. But lots of these patients are elective. So what extra do you do for that patient who is clearly at risk of dehiscence? Does anybody have a plan? Or do you just go, oh, they might break down? We can do extra things. We can, we can do things to prepare for that. We can do prophylactic things. So we need to start planning ahead a lot more. From my perspective, the biggest difficulty is selling prevention, selling it to the people who will give you the time and the money. Because you haven't got a, an outcome for them to measure. Something didn't happen. And that's really difficult to measure, isn't it? Because it might have not happened in the first place. It's not that because of what you did. So I want to finish on this slide, and I take no credit for this. I saw Duncan Stang, who's a podiatrist. He has this for diabetic foot prevention. So CPR for skin. CPR, you all know it's easy to remember. Check the patient's skin. Protect the patient's skin. Everything I've told you today is really simple, really straightforward. And picking up on the point from Burns, if needs be, refer on and get some help, but get it early because early intervention is what makes for better outcomes for the patients further down the line. Thank you very much.